We're going to get a little bit technical today uh, in terms of understanding what some of the technologies do. Uh, I'll try and make it fun and uh, hopefully educational, of course, in terms of seeing what some of these technologies are. Um, though some of you are not going to be the most technical of backgrounds, though, so please stop me as we're going along. And uh, Peter Naj, who's here in the audience, is actually going to be picking up where I'd left, leave off. Uh, and so Peter next week is going to be talking, doing a much deeper dive actually into some of these technologies. Uh, but I'll give you kind of the background in terms of starting this out. Okay, so the point is the following. Uh, we're going to try and make you into a genomicist after the next couple lectures. Uh, but most importantly, what we're trying to do is get you to understand, I think, the limitations of what we can and can't do with this technology. At least that's what my goal is. Um, there's certainly a lot of amazing things we can do, but I want you to understand the limitations of everything that we are doing as we uh, become, go into this era where we're reading out your genes. So I'm going to use, um, for those of you who are not sort of necessarily the most scientifically inclined for this, I'm going to use a lot of analogies and try and make this really quite, uh, I hope, simple as we're doing this. And uh, apologies to those of you who are much more sophisticated about this. Um, so when we think about doing this, what we want to be able to do at this point is basically a genetic inventory. And so we want to be able to do this on the macro scale as well as the micro scale. And so all of you know by now from the last couple lectures that our genetic information is housed in these structures called chromosomes. There are 46 of those. Those are analogous to me. Uh, at least I still have sets of encyclopedias in my house, believe it or not. Um, so these are analogous to me to a set of 46 encyclopedias. So we've got all of these books here. And at the first level of inventory, what we want to be able to do is a simple counting experiment. Count and see if we see that 46 volumes are there or if any volume is extra or any volume is missing. And as I said, um, although I'd like to think my children are special, uh, they're not that special. And my kids could tell just grossly whether or not there were 46 chromosomes on a karyotype by the time they were three years old. So this is not a sort of complicated uh, experiment to do at this level of analysis. Um, what we can see in certain cases is that there's actually a chromosome missing or a chromosome extra. And again, that's the very easiest level of analysis to do. And that's essentially like seeing that the you know, Z volume is missing or the M volume is missing from your set of encyclopedias. And, and again, that karyotype will be able to get you that type of information. But when you think about it, and when you think about all of human diseases that might be due to underlying genetic reasons, it's a very small proportion that will be due to those sort of very gross chromosomal problems. Um, one of the things you've probably been learning is that the earlier you get in developments, the more likely they can be associated with these very gross derangements. So fetal anomalies, uh, children, young children with problems can be due to things like Down syndrome or an extra copy of chromosome 21. Uh, but things like chromosome trisomy 13, trisomy 18, in fact, are so severe that those babies oftentimes almost always are not born living. They actually die during some point in fetal development. So that's great, but let's do a deeper dive. Okay, so when we do a deeper dive, we actually want to be able to open up each one of those sets of encyclopedias and now do an inventory at a higher level of resolution. So that could be, for instance, looking page by page, chapter by chapter, eventually paragraph by paragraph, sentence by sentence, word by word, and eventually letter by letter. Okay, but the point is, is that there are different technologies to be able to get that macro view versus that micro view. And at this point, Although our, we eventually hope to converge at the point where you could use a single omnibus technology to get at all of that, right now we haven't optimized that. So we have kind of these macro levels and these micro levels of analysis. Once we get to the point of doing essentially a page by page analysis, it's oftentimes at the micro level where we're doing this, but there is some overlap in terms of micro versus macro. So we can do that. We can see at this point that the paragraph is missing. We can even see drilling down to that a single letter might be missing, a single word might be missing, or a single letter might be missing. And so that's basically the analysis that we eventually want to be able to do is on a genome wide basis, do that inventory of three billion base pairs and be able to do all of that accounting and to see what your normal differences are as well as the ones that will eventually lead to disease. So many of you have heard uh, I and others talk about it. The limitation is that this is still quite expensive. And so um, it's been even more expensive in the past, but even at the very best prices we can get at the New York Genome Center right now, it's still $1,500 per person to sequence a genome to get all of those three billion letters, uh, $1,500. That's great in terms of what it used to be, uh, certainly come down in price, um, but that's just data generation. Doesn't have anything to do with data storage, doesn't have to do with interpretation that's sort of bare bones of just generating your data. So many of us have been 
on, unfortunately, NIH budgets, which have been decreasing over time, and we've had to figure out how to stretch our dollars further. And so one shortcut that we have taken in the fields uh, was actually a technology uh, developed by Jay Shinduri. Um, the idea that we thought most mutations that we would recognize, at least for right now, would be within the coding sequences of genes. Um, and so those you know are exons, or those little, uh, as I'll show you, gold nuggets that get strung together to make genes. This is what our genome actually looks like before we can see, uh, make sense of it. But again, if I highlight for you where those exons are, you'll see that embedded within that gobbledygook is the Gettysburg Address. And in fact, that's essentially the way our genomes are set up at this point, is that about 1.5 percent of that information are these golden nuggets. The other 98.5 percent are stuff that we don't know what it does for the most part right now. Well, I'm sure m much of it is important, but we just don't understand it. So let's start now in terms of the technologies at the macro level. So the highest macro level, again, is a karyotype. So this is where you can see these stick figures. Um, I want you, though, to imagine, uh, again, I can count, my kids can count to 46. That's not a problem. But believe it or not, the expectation is, is that you can see actually every one of 650 bands on these set of chromosomes. And I don't know about you looking at this, but I can tell you I tried this. So when I went through my genetics training, I had decisions about what to do. I could get boarded in clinical genetics. and uh, biochemical genetics and cytogenetics and molecular genetics. I actually tried my very hardest to be able to be a cytogeneticist, and my eyes are just not good enough. I cannot, I knew that I could not reproducibly see those 650 bands and feel confident that I was consistently calling the right diagnosis. So I gave up after about three months of cytogenetics much to Dorothy Warburton's chagrin, um, but to be able to do this. Because I just, based on the current technology at the time, I didn't feel that I could do that reliably. But that is what giants like Dorothy Warburton have done for her entire life. They're incredibly good at doing this, um, but it is difficult to be able to do this reproducibly and perfectly. So the field of cytogenetics went through some uh, uh, changes in a good way to be able to now tag certain sp spots within the genome using these uh, fish probes or fluorescent in situ hybridization. And so this became now again a simple counting experiment. Um, I apologize to those of you who are red, green, colorblind because this makes uh, it more challenging for you to count the red and the green dots. But essentially you're now back to a simple counting experiment that kindergartners can do. Do you have two dots? Do you have three dots? Do you have one dot? Uh, but being able to see for any any specific gene that you're interested in interrogating, is there an extra copy or is it a missing copy? So you now have to, you don't have to look and see is that teeny tiny band there missing? You can simply put a fish probe on it and now make it a very simple counting experiment. So that's a wonderful thing, being able to have that fish technology. But the problem with that is, is that's great if you have a hypothesis about what the gene is that you're looking for that's either deleted or extra. So if you're a really good geneticist and you know how to recognize a condition like the George syndrome, you know what fish probe to order and you will make the diagnosis in a very, very cost-effective and reliable way. But unfortunately, we know through time that most clinicians are not that good. Um, there's just a lot they need to know and they don't often know these subtleties. And so even for the most common of microdeletion syndromes, things like the George syndrome, things like Williams syndrome, I can tell you these get missed very, very often just because kids also grow into the diagnosis. As a newborn baby, for instance, they may not have all the clinical features, they may not have developed all the symptoms, and so it can become quite difficult to be able to correctly make these diagnoses. So as a result of that, um, and again, uh, you know, I'm, uh, there were many brilliant people who thought of this. Mike Wiggler was the first one that I dealt with who had thought of this. Um, the idea was, can you actually do fish, but can you do fish on speed? So rather than doing one probe at a time and trying to interrogate one condition at a time, can you now scale this? I love this term of scale. So can you scale this so you can now do this throughout a genome with not just one fish probe, but can you do it with 100,000 fish probes? Or can you do it with a million fish probes? Or at this point, we oftentimes do it with three or four five million fish probes, essentially. And so the beauty of that is that you no longer have to be hypothesis driven. You don't have to know ahead of time what you think the diagnosis is. You can go on a fishing expedition. Ah. Okay, so you can do this and you can do this and then the amazing thing about this is the technology allows you to do it on literally a tiny little glass slide or there are other ways that we have this, but literally one centimeter by one centimeter, teeny tiny little, you know, oftentimes uh, microscopic uh, dots of these hybrid probes that you're using. 
and it scales in cost because you're doing it on a micro scale. So you've heard of nanotechnology. It's this type of idea that you can scale this down and get your reagent cost to be very, very low because, again, you're using very small amounts of this. So as you do this, uh, what you're literally doing is there are different ways of manufacturing this, but you're essentially putting a known oligonucleotide down. So a known sequence of DNA, you know exactly where that DNA maps. You know it's on chromosome 1 at coordinate 6,552. You, know, you know exactly where it maps to, and you're doing a counting experiment one by one on each one of those little dots. You're saying, how many copies of that little probe do I have? I have 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4, and you do this, and you do it across the entire genome as you do it. You can do this, and you can design these in any way you like. So if you want to have a very high-density probe, go for it. Make it as high density as you want to. If you want to concentrate on a very specific portion of the genome, go for it. You can actually design these things literally and customize it and change it on a day-to-day -day basis. And so it's tremendously flexible to be able to do this. But the one thing it uh, tells you about is imbalances, gains or losses. It's a counting experiment. It doesn't tell you structure. It doesn't tell you things are, you know, like scrambled eggs and mixed up in terms of order. All it does is it tells you about, about gains or losses. <coughs> Excuse me, but it can do that with very, very high resolution. So in the old days when we started doing this, and we started actually way too many years ago with Mike Wiggler doing this, we would take these and we would take a, an unknown person, a patient, and then we would take a normal person. The normal person, I don't know how normal they were, but we used to always take someone from our laboratory, and at least we knew what their abnormalities were, um, but they were very reproducible. Uh, we would label them with two different colors of probe uh, or two different colors uh, of uh, fluorophore, mix them together, and essentially then hybridize that to one of these fixed probes down here and be able to compare how much did I have of the patient versus how much did I have from the reference person and be able to then use a laser to scan all over this and see these yellow dots, for instance, meant that you had equal amounts for that particular region from the patient and from the control, and then you could be able to see gains or losses like this. This now produced this into digital data that was much, much easier to interpret, much more reproducible, much easier to scale, and much less expensive. So this is a normal person with an, uh, individuals. This is meant to show you across a chromosome, for instance, beginning of the chromosome to the end of cr the chromosome. This is the copy number. You end up with a little bit of noise, but what this is telling you is that for this individual person, they have a copy number of two every place that you looked at. They're normal. They have the same amount as the reference individual. On the other hand, for this person here, they have a normal amount here, but all of a sudden within this region here, from probe after probe after probe, right next to each other, they have less, so they have a deletion. This other person here, you actually have a gain, and so you have more of that and you have a duplication. And so we can do this very, very reliably. One of the things you should realize, though, is that all of us have these copy number variations, right? This is a normal thing about being human. It's not like we all have exactly two copies of every single region within our genome. It is normal for us to have, depending on how high, uh, how much resolution you use in this, anywhere from 20 to 200 of these, what we call copy number variations, or CNVs. So the one thing you have to realize is you have to have a good catalog of what normal variation is before you try and call out abnormal variation. And that's one of the lessons we learned over and over in terms of genetics and genomics is know what normal is before you try and call out abnormal. We haven't always followed that sequence of events, but in theory that's what one would like to do as you develop this. Okay, so the point to this is you can now get this to the point that I could even teach you, if you can use a computer, I can teach you within a few days how to be able to read one of these. It would take me two years to teach my fellows how to read a karyotype reproducibly. This now is something we can actually teach you. You don't necessarily have to have a PhD to do this. Um, because what you can see is you can see deflection of this uh, point, all these points downward. So this is just simply all of these different probes all along a chromosome region, and you see very reproducibly this deflection downward. And you can now see, because you know where each one of these dots map, you can actually put this on a genome browser and you can say, oh, this is the BMP2 gene, this is another gene here. You can catalog and actually know every single gene that's entailed within this particular deletion and start making clinical correlations between that, and you can get very, very high resolution in doing so. So this is now something that has dropped the price of being able to do this much, much lower. We can decrease the turnaround times. We can do this faster, uh, much more inexpensively and much more reproducibly. So that's a wonderful thing. On the other hand, again, that's the macro level. So those are going to allow you to see big events. How do you actually get to the smaller events? Knowing that the smaller events are going to be where the burden, the biggest burden of disease is, probably 90 percent of that burden. 
Okay, so you'll remember that there are lots of different types of these micro changes that you can see. Single nucleotide substitutions, things that change splices, or these uh, little signals here that tell you to cut and paste the exons together, promoter regions here that tell you how much of the gene product to make or when to make it. Um, these other things we'll get to uh, that involve translocations and inversions, sort of the scrambled egg or the jumbling of the information, uh, as well as larger deletions and duplications. So we all want to be able to catalog all of those types of things, and in particular when it comes to these single nucleotide events, be able to think, see things that are what we call missense changes, things that change in amino acid, as well as things that will basically destroy a protein by causing a premature termination or affecting, as I said, one of these regulatory sequences. Okay. So I'm not going to go through all of this, uh, but just to give you a sense that oftentimes as we're doing this, we need basically a way of being able to have a molecular Xerox machine. So in other words, we want to be able to take a blood sample from you and we don't want to have to, you know, take a gallon of blood from you to do these experiments. Uh, in some cases, believe it or not, we may want to take just a little tiny, you know, like half a cc of blood from a little tiny baby, or maybe we may just want to take a little scrape of a cheek swab from your cheek to be able to do these. So I'm not going to go through all the details, but just to say that PCR or polymerase chain reaction is sort of the, the way we oftentimes start all of these, um, and it allows us to do a lot of things on uh, very small nanoscales to be able to, to make things that are large enough for us to be able to see these events. So just suffice it to say that that oftentimes is the first step within a lot of these procedures. Um, if anyone keeping track of these things. Again, you'll remember that this was what the Nobel Prize was given for, was being able to actually develop this technology because it has been such a huge enabler in terms of being able to drive uh, a lot of molecular diagnostics as we've done it. Um, as you do this, remember there are ways of being able to use this same technology to distinguish um, you from someone else. So we use this both in terms of forensics uh, as well as in terms of diagnostics. Um, and we even use this, you know, for the who's your daddy type of experiment. Uh, so trying to be able to tell paternity and maternity in cases, um, or if you want to figure out your dog and whether you're a pure breed, we use these same types of things for them as well. Um, so these things can scale, um, and this is just one methodology where you can see this is actually many, many different markers all on a single lane from a single individual. Uh, and again, the idea is that you can miniaturize these as we get to, to do these things bigger. And I won't go into lots of details, but these happen to be uh, repeats that we can do, and we can see how many repeats a certain person has. Um, or you can do these as single nucleotide variants, but you can do all sorts of genetic markers to try and distinguish self from non-self as you're doing it. So here come some of the caveats, and, and this is, again, sort of for the technical aficionados and for some of you who are clinicians. Um, so polymerase chain reaction, as a first step, relies on being able to have primers sit down. Let me just show you a picture again having primers sit down in the region where you want to synthesize. So one primer here, one primer here, and basically what you're doing is filling in the gap between this primer here and this primer here by doing these rounds of amplification. And each time you do a round of amplification, you double the amount of DNA you have from that target region, and only from that target region that's defined by this primer and defined by this primer. However, and this is the big caveat, what happens when one of those primers is not sitting down correctly for whatever reason? And it could be, just as one example, all of us have normal genetic variations. Sometimes, and this happened to me this last week, you'll unwittingly design a primer and it'll sit down on one of these polymorphic sites which might be different between you and I. And it might be different enough that that primer actually won't stick where it's supposed to and won't eventually start that PCR chain reaction. And you can have something that we call allelic dropout, or in other words, not seeing that particular allele because your molecular Xerox machine for this one particular version of this gene didn't amplify and you didn't see it. And so you can actually end up getting false negative results because you didn't correctly actually amplify the allele with the mutation. So there's always a limitation. You'll see whenever you read the technical parts of any genetic test, no genetic test is ever going to swear it's 100% accurate because there are these very specific technical details which we try and minimize, but that happens sometimes. In addition to that, one thing that's sometimes even more difficult is one of those primers, for instance, say you have a deletion. So say these are, this is the way your gene is set up, these are your exons, this might be the sequence within the exon. One deletion might be just a single letter G that's missing. So you can see from this version of the gene to this version of the gene, all you're missing is one single little letter. In this version of the gene, there's a bigger deletion. You're missing this whole exon here that's missing from this region here. And in this last version of the gene, you're just missing the whole gene altogether. 
entirely, okay? And so the problem is if you went in with a molecular method that was, for instance, sequence-based, where you said, oh, I want to be able to detect something like here. I'm going to pick a PCR primer, I'm going to put one down here, I'm going to put a PCR primer down over here, and I'm going to amplify this region, and I'm just going to read out the letters, C, A, T, G, T, A, G, and I'm going to expect that I can read out all those letters. Well, that's great for picking up this type of mutation, because you'll pick up and you'll see the difference between one G here and one G here. But the problem is, for a deletion like this, if your PCR primers should be sitting down here and here, but now that sequence is missing, it's gone, it's deleted, all of a sudden you are not going to amplify that particular region of the genome, and you won't know what you're missing. In other words, you will have amplified the genome, but in this particular case, and you'll read out the sequence perfectly fine from that normal allele, and you will totally miss the boat that you've actually missed this other version of the gene that had a deletion smack dab in the middle of it. So as a result of that, we end up with these technical limitations, which again, we try and mitigate, we try and use complementary methods between the macro and the micro to be able to see this. But the point I'm trying to make, and I'm sorry I keep hammering at home, but it's important, is that if you don't actually use complementary technologies based on what our current technology allows us to do, you can miss things. And so sometimes you just say, I'm willing to miss things, I understand that this is not 100% sensitive, but just realize that you can miss things as you're doing that. So this is simply what I was showing you before. Here are your primers, and again, if you have something like this, you might just entirely miss that particular region. So on the other hand, point mutations tend to be a little bit easier for us to find. Again, they're things that as long as you can make that PCR product, you should be able to see them. And then it becomes not a question of correctly generating the data, but the question becomes more interpretation of the data. In other words, you see a genetic variant, are you going to correctly classify it as good, bad, or ugly? And if you don't correctly classify it, then you may actually make a mistake in interpretation, not data generation, but interpretation of the data. And this is actually a very interesting part. I just had this, like, enormous discussion of this this morning. So I'm actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to throw the question out to you, because this was a question I had this morning that I was trying to figure out. Okay. So we have, you know, we've been doing genetic testing for a long time, okay? And so we have all of these, you know, results that we have in databases that we have. So one of the things that you may or may not have heard about is that sometimes we'll have these uh, proficiency tests. So we'll actually take the same sample, and we do this for standardization in clinical laboratories. We'll take the same sample, we'll actually give it to several different laboratories, and we'll have them do the same test in all these different laboratories, and it's basically a test to see how well they're doing, if they're proficient, right? So you would expect that if they're doing this correctly, you should get the same result back from all five laboratories, right? It's sort of, you know, a, a test to see how well they're doing. So in some cases, the proficiency test works very well, and Peter will tell you this, everyone gets the same result because these are straightforward experiments, straightforward tests. I can tell you, though, in some cases that they, especially for the very advanced forms of genomic testing that we now do, they actually have their concordance rate between the different tests as low as 50%. So in other words, they come up with very different answers, very different interpretations with the way, with the most advanced of the testing that we're doing. And I'm not pointing fingers and saying anyone's right or wrong, because in some cases we actually don't know what the truth is with a capital T. We just know that there are differences both in terms of data generation, but more importantly with interpretation. Okay, so here's the question that came up for me this morning. So the American College of Medical Genetics has tried to standardize the way the whole genomics community is doing interpretation. They have tried to make this more unified so that from one laboratory to another, we're using the same standards in terms of interpreting that data as the good, bad, or the ugly. And again, this goes into the categories of essentially pathogenic, benign, and somewhere in the middle where we don't know. That's what I mean by good, bad, and ugly. Okay, so many of us have generated data for many, many years. We have these data in databases. The American College of Medical Genetics came out now with standards and guidelines. And the board, you know, voted on this, and they decided this is the way we shall interpret variants. There are specific algorithms. It's very complicated, but it now gives you a very standard thing that, in theory, if you follow those rules exactly, if you see the same variation, any laboratory should interpret this the same way. 
the way they happen to adopt these guidelines, they're relatively conservative in the sense that many things that got classified previously as sort of hedging towards it being, you know, just completely normal or hedging toward it being a mutation, even though we didn't know for sure, now the standards are much more conservative. And they're saying, no, we don't want you to hedge anything because that, you know, sort of you, you start guessing too much. We don't like guessing. We're going to have you classify a lot of things as just straight up variants of uncertain significance, straight down the middle of the road. We don't know. You need to wait till you have a lot more evidence to be able to interpret these. So here's the question that we had this morning. So now that these standards have changed, right, so now the American College has adopted new standards, all of us have these legacy of cases that we've interpreted in the past, and we have these, you know, ways that we've interpreted them, good, bad, or ugly, into these five different categories. Now, what are we to do? So now we're going to have these new standards. They'll start, you know, officially, we'll just say it's going to be April 1st. What is our responsibility as laboratories for those patients? Right? So you have to realize some of these are patients that have been seen five years ago, ten years ago, and I've asked you a similar question in the past for those of you who have attended consistently. So, but the question is, what is my responsibility now? So as these come back, am I supposed to go back through my database, apply the new algorithms, and go back and reclassify those variants? And if I do, am I responsible? Should I be going back and telling the physician? Should I issue a revised report as I do that? If I do that, then what's the responsibility on a physician? who may not know where that patient is, they may not have seen them for years and years, is it on them then to have to be able to find that patient, hunt them down, get them that information? We don't, although we talked about this before, and my fantasy would be you'd have direct access to the patient through a patient portal, we don't have that. Clearly, but that is not an option for right now. So one question is, do you have an obligation to do that, or do you just say, you know what, what's gone is gone, what's past is past, nothing I can do about it now? Okay, so I'm going to give you three options. Number one is you say, no, I should go back. I should reclassify those variants. I should find those docs, and, you know, somehow we should get that information back to patients. That's option number one. Option number two is what's done is done. You can't, you know, you did the best you could at the time, but, you know, realistically we can't go back and, and you know, be able to take on this huge burden for doing that. So option number two is no, just, you know, you leave it alone. And option number three is I'm just a student. I'm here to learn, and I have no opinion on the matter. Okay, so who says option one? You, you have an obligation to go back and find these people? Who says option number two? Come on, let's be real. And who has option number three? I'm just here to learn. Okay, very, very proud of you. We'll try and teach you something. Um, so the, the, I'm going to throw in one thing um, now to make it a little bit perhaps easier. So you might say as a laboratory, golly gee, you know, I've done 50,000 cases. You really can't expect me to go back to 50,000 cases. I mean, I'd never be able to get a new test out the door if I had to do that. But on the other hand, when I'm going through my regular workflow of new cases coming through, I might come across a variant, and under the new guidelines, I might do the interpretation of that variant. And under today, April 1st guidelines, I might classify it something differently than I did on March 1st, right? Now, if I do that, I can quickly go through my database. I've done the work of reclassifying this variant for this new case. Should I go back now to my database for anyone I classified before April 1st and pull them out and issue revised reports to them? Maybe the burden isn't quite so much in that particular case, right? So same way of voting. So same choices. How many people say yes? Under that model, you should go back and you should reissue these reports. How many people say no? Gosh, you just got it. You drew the line. You're not going back. And how many people say, I just, I really don't know. You're above my pay grade. Okay, so anyway, the reason I bring this up, I actually don't know the right answer, to be totally honest. We're trying to decide some of these, you know, sort of how we're going to deal with things as we go on. The one thing I will say, um, so let me just make this yet a little bit more complicated. Um, so one of the things that I had always thought um, is that, you know, as we were doing this, as we interpret variants, in the community, we oftentimes think that we've got people who are really, really knowledgeable about certain genes. They're kind of domain experts of certain genes. We give them a lot of faith, a lot of trust. There are certain consortia that work in this, and uh, we have great respect for them. And we historically have weighted them a little bit higher in terms of we think they understand the disease, the disease mechanism. Uh, we tend to go to them as experts for interpretation of data. But let me give you the following scenario, because this actually did happen. So as you're interpreting one of these genes, uh, it may have been in the past based on, again, one of these experts' opinions who said, absolutely, that's a mutation. We've done research in lots of families. Absolutely, that's a mutation. We're very, very clear on that. 
But all of a sudden now we're getting more and more population data that are actually reinforming this. We didn't have this when these experts thought these were mutations. And so we're getting more and more data about this that's now actually putting us on much shakier ground for some of these things that were mutations. And now they start looking not so much like mutations, but in fact just like normal variants that weren't recognized before. So as you're doing that, some of these come for genes that matter in the sense of actually driving a medical intervention. So as an example, some of these have to do with genes for hereditary cancer predispositions, where for instance, one might have done something pretty radical like do a mastectomy or do something uh, more sort of definitive and irreversible in terms of doing that. Does that change your thinking now? under the scenarios that I just told you about. So now it's not, you know, just sort of a matter of, well, you know, this is a nice day, you had a diagnosis, it didn't really make a difference. Does that change your sort of ethical obligation to be able to go back to those people and, you know, give them the best information? Because otherwise they might be, you know, taking, again, if they really think it's a mutation for a pretty severe disease like breast cancer, you know, are they going to take a more, you know, sort of definitive and irreversible uh, procedure that way? So we're going to do the same vote again. So under that circumstance where you're now talking about one of these hereditary breast cancer genes, how many people say, yeah, I have an obligation, you know, as these things come up, to be able to go and issue revised reports and go back to those people, okay? And now how many people say, ah, gosh, you know what, what's done is done, I can't, you know, that's a pretty high standard, I don't have the resources to do that, okay? And how many people say, I just, I don't know, you got me on this one. Okay, so what's interesting is if you guys, I should have been tallying these, but if you guys looked around the room as you were doing this, in this last scenario, people felt like they had, at least the sense I'm getting from you guys, is you felt like you had more of an obligation because this was something, again, sort of actionable, potentially life-saving, but in this particular case, uh, you know, taking a procedure. So now let me just tell you the interesting thing about this, though. As you start doing that as a laboratory, as a clinical laboratory doing this, now how much hot water do you get into because someone has actually done something irreversible, right? So they've done something like they've done a prophylactic mastectomy and now you tell them I was trying to give you the best available information because right now 2015 April 1st this is the best that I know and golly gee you had a mastectomy and oh my goodness we told you the best we knew at the time but guess what we were wrong I mean what do you think that's going to do in terms of the patient trust in the community that we have instilled you to know this you know you should know these things with a truth with a capital T we're making these you know great sort of important irreversible me medical decisions I mean are you are you, you know should you be sued in those particular cases you you did the best you could at the time you did it with the best knowledge of the best experts who were available at the time but you know what? We are not perfect. This is not an absolute perfect science as you're doing it. And so the concern, you know, with some of the laboratorians as well, as I said, is as you're thinking about doing this, they're also thinking about, number one, what's their responsibility to their patients? Absolutely. But as well, what are their vulnerabilities from a medical legal liability point of view? And then if you put the locus of control on the physician as well, what is that to dump that on a physician in terms of having to now try and find the patient and track them down and doing this? So anyway, I throw this in because this is not just all about the, you know, sort of dry science that goes with this. This is really thinking about this. Jill. So this is in the old days what we do, used to do with Sanger sequencing. This was very lovely, but it doesn't scale nearly as well in terms of cost. Uh, and so now what we've got are methods of uh, massive parallel sequencing. So just for the fun of it, uh, let me see if I can do this. I wanted to let you guys actually see what happens. So this is the type of sequencing technology that we uh, is the most scalable and is actually who won out the beta versus VHS war. This is Illumina. I'm not here to advertise for them, but this is what we do. DNA. The first step in Nextera sample preparation is tagmentation. During tagmentation, transposomes simultaneously fragment and tag the input DNA with adapters. Once the adapters have been ligated, reduce cycle amplification adds additional motifs, such as the sequencing primer binding sites, indices, and regions that are complementary to the flow cell oligos. Clustering is a process wherein each fragment molecule is isothermally amplified. The flow cell is a glass slide with lanes, each lane is a channel coated with a lawn composed of two types of oligos. Hybridization is enabled by the first of the two types of oligos on the surface. This oligo is complementary to the adapter region on one of the fragment strands. A polymerase creates a complement of the hybridized fragment. The double-stranded molecule is denatured and the original template is washed away. <laughs> 
the strands are clonally amplified through bridge amplification. In this process, the strand folds over and the adapter region hybridizes to the second type of oligo on the flow cell. Polymerases generate the complementary strand, forming a double-stranded bridge. This bridge is denatured, resulting in two single-stranded copies of the molecule that are tethered to the flow cell. The process is then repeated over and over and occurs simultaneously for millions of clusters, resulting in clonal amplification of all the fragments. After bridge amplification, the reverse strands are cleaved and washed off, leaving only the forward strands. The three prime ends are blocked to prevent unwanted priming. Sequencing begins with the extension of the first sequencing primer to produce the first read. With each cycle, four fluorescently tagged nucleotides compete for addition to the growing chain. Only one is incorporated based on the sequence of the template. After the addition of each nucleotide, the clusters are excited by a light source and a characteristic fluorescent signal is emitted. This proprietary process is called sequencing by synthesis. The number of cycles determines the length of the read. The emission wavelength, along with the signal intensity, determine the base call. For a given cluster, all identical strands are read simultaneously. Hundreds of millions of clusters are sequenced in a massively parallel process. This image represents a small fraction of the flow cell. After the completion of the first read, the read product is washed away. In this step, the index 1 read primer is introduced and hybridized to the template. The read is generated similar to the first read. After completion of the index read, the read product is washed off and the three prime end of the template is deprotected. The template now folds over and binds the second oligo on the flow cell. Index 2 is read in the same manner as index 1. Index I'm going to cut this short just from in the interest of time. The idea that I want you to get is, again, a glass slide. It's got regular glass slide, right, that you're used to in the microscope, eight different lanes into it, and you can generate literally data on like 100 people within this doing this, and it happens over the course of potentially about 24 hours, depending on how fast you run these and how you do these, and can generate with one of those, for instance, on 100 people, information on 100 genes or more at a time. So in other words, you can scale this tremendously in terms of being able to do this. I won't go through all of this, uh, as I said, just in the to interest read of time. product Oops. is Sorry. washed off at the in the interest of time. The interest completion of this step. Sorry. Um, for those people who are interested in this, if there's anyone from the business school that's in here, um, the interesting thing for me, in part, is actually how this evolved in terms of, as I said, the beta versus VHS. So as we saw which companies got into this and who won and who ended up being dominant, um, there used to be companies like Solid, which probably some of you haven't heard about anymore because they actually went away, uh, essentially, in terms of doing this. But there have been some other interesting technologies. So I'm just going to show you this one. This is actually based on pH as the way of being able to detect a different as you're sequencing. Unfortunately, it hasn't scaled as well as we'd like to, but it's just a very clever way of thinking about this. So I'm just going to show this to you briefly. The other half of this technology is based on a simple and well-characterized biochemical process. In nature, each time a base is incorporated into a strand of DNA by a polymerase, a hydrogen ion is released. Ion torrent uses a high density array of micro machine wells to perform this simple biochemical process in a massively parallel way. Each well holds a different DNA template. Beneath the wells is an ion sensitive layer and beneath that a proprietary ion sensor. Here's how the technology is used to call a base. First a single nucleotide, say a C, is added to a DNA template. Next, if you measure a change in the pH in your solution, you know hydrogen was released, meaning the nucleotide was incorporated. The hydrogen ion is converted to voltage and recorded by the semiconductor sensor. Our sequencer, essentially the world's smallest solid state pH meter, has called the base, going directly from chemical information to digital information. The ion torrent sequencer then sequentially floods the chip with one nucleotide after another. Let's say the next nucleotide that floods the chip is not a match, 
No voltage change will be recorded and no base will be called. If there are two identical bases on the DNA strand, the voltage will be double and the chip will record two identical bases called. Because this is direct detection, no scanning, no cameras, no light, each nucleotide incorporation happens in seconds. It takes no longer for the chip to perform 500 million reads than it does to perform 5 million, and you can do an entire run in an hour. The semiconductor will inevitably transform the life sciences. The idea with this, I think, when Ion Torrent thought about this, is you could make these machines small enough, this could be inexpensive enough, that you could put this in every doctor's office. This was a way of being able to scale genetic testing, very easy to use, very simple, just plug and play type of thing. Um, interestingly enough, the Achilles heel for this particular technology, I, it's very subtle, except for those of you who are real aficionados, um, is the idea of homopolymers. So the idea that if you have the same nucleotide one after another in a row, so like you saw when it, two T's come in in a row, it puts in one T, it puts in another T, and you get double the voltage uh, in terms of the pH change. The problem is that works if it's one versus two, but how about if you have five or seven or nine T's that are all together? It becomes very, very difficult to tell the difference between seven and eight T's, for instance. And so the Achilles heel in terms of some of the accuracy for this has been exactly that, and that one limitation of it, in my opinion, um, has made has, has produced great limitations in terms terms of what, what people have used this for and how well it's been adopted. Um, let me just give you one other example uh, because this is potentially where some of this is going in the future, um, which is now um, being able to read single molecules. So I'll tell you, this is a DNA polymerase that's doing this. It's building this by adding nucleotides as it's going through. And the point to this is it's just doing continuous synthesis. So it's making one strand a very, very, very long strand in this particular case, and it's doing sequencing by synthesis as it's doing it. And this isn't projecting very well in terms of sound, so I won't, I won't belabor the point. But some of the other new technologies, which I didn't show you today, are things like Oxford nanopore, which are even more remarkable in that they're literally a pore through which the DNA strand goes, and as that DNA strand is going, it actually reads out the sequence. It's not even doing any synthesis, it's just literally reading the sequence as it goes through a single pore to be able to do it. So the reason why I say this is that there are tremendous interesting opportunities um, in terms of mainly engineers uh, in being able to develop some of these ne new technologies, but it's been interesting, and I'll get off my soapbox in just a second, um, that if you look at this from a business point of view, Illumina has really dominated the market, uh, started out as Celexa and then became Illumina. They've really dominated the market and been able to squash almost any other of their other competitors, um, some by good means and some by other not so good means as they've done it. Um, and as they've done it, though, they've really been able to control price. And so the interesting thing is if you look at the cost of sequencing over time, uh, we could have actually gone down tremendously. Illumina has at many times had much better chemistry to be able to drive down the cost, be able to actually miniaturize things even further. But you always, I, we actually, you know, we know from the inside, they hold these things back because they know what their demand is and they essentially know how they can maximize their profits in doing it. And so they act like a business rather than acting in the best interest of the scientific and medical community. But anyway, now I'll get off the soapbox. Um, so the, the reason that I want to just show you this for one second is that what we actually generate in many of these cases are not the huge long reads that I just showed you from PacBio, but we actually generate short reads. In the early days, they could have been as short as 35 reads. Now they're up to usually about 100 or 150 reads. But what this requires is now you have to computationally essentially concatenate all of these reads by literally being able to stack these one on top of another. So what you can see, do you see this sort of edge here that looks like it's ripped? That because each one of these sequences is not sequencing the exact same fragment. It's sequencing here, and then it's jumping over a little bit here and a little bit over here. And you have to be able to align these to now get the complete sequence when you put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And from a computational point of view, that can actually be quite intensive. And for any of you that are really interested in this, when this sequence doesn't align perfectly, sometimes computationally, the computer doesn't know how to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And so there are certain types of mutations, in particular big insertions or deletions, that don't actually get computationally aligned very well. And so this is a very big sort of limitation in terms of some of this technology currently. And we don't actually know what we're missing in certain cases. But it's the reason why in certain cases, um, people would like to be able to do whole genome sequencing or at least larger read length. 
The other thing that Jill always reminds me of, so I'm going to remind you as well, is that with this technology and having these short sequence reads, when you have these repeats within this region here, they also do not align very well. And because they don't align very well or very specifically, the limitation is that you can't actually read out those read links with great accuracy. And so whenever it comes to any of the triplet repeat disorders, things like Huntington's, uh, many other things that uh, also have to repeat disorders, we essentially cannot get that type of diagnostic from this test. So if you are worried about getting your Huntington's diagnosis from whole exome sequencing, have no fear. We can't tell you about it. Um, there are other tests we can do specifically for this, but we cannot tell that, at least at this point, from exome sequencing. So let me just keep rolling right along. Um, within all of this, as I said, this is the uh, cost decrease we've had in terms of sequencing. It could have been better. Um, but as this has changed, it's been interesting to see what's happened in terms of what we can do from clinical diagnostics. So when I first entered this uh, era about, you know, 15 years ago, we were, single, we were sequencing single genes. It was like a big deal that we could sequence single genes. We were so excited to be able to do that clinically. About seven, eight years ago, we went through doing whole sort of panels of genes. So we got up to 10, 20 genes at a time. And we thought that was like revolutionary. Um, and now, as many of you know, we're sequencing really whole genomes as we're doing this. Um, and as we're doing it, it's because we can drop the cost in terms of uh, being able to actually afford to do all of this. Um, Again, Dr. Uh, Peter Naj is going to spend a lot more time talking about this, but even though you generate the data very well, it all comes down to interpreting what that means. And so we're going to be talking a lot more to you about how you actually interpret that and what it means, as I said before. So those are all um, things that we do when we don't know what mutation we're looking for. So in other words, we may think that a patient has a particular disease, but we don't know what gene it is necessarily, or even within the gene, what particular mutation it is. So we're a little bit going looking for a needle in the haystack. And as we're going looking for the needle in the haystack, we kind of have to be agnostic to what we're looking for. And that introduces some of the problems that I've told you about. It's a very different game if you know what you're looking for. So in this particular case, and this is oftentimes what we do with what we call carry screening, so for many different recessive disorders where women are wanting to know whether or not they could have a baby with something like spinal muscular atrophy or sickle cell disease or cystic fibrosis, we have panels of mutations that we know are fairly common in the population, and we want to go in and we want to target those and say, Delta 508, is it there or not there? We know exactly what we're looking for, we just simply need a plus or minus readout in terms of doing that. So I'm not going to go through all of this today with you, but just suffice it to say there are multiple different technologies. There are usually different technologies and what we use for sequencing to be able to plus or minus say a variant is there. And we can get the cost now, depending on how you do this, to, for instance, a Nicola genotype in many cases, or sometimes even less than that. And so again, if you think about knowing what you want to look for, going in and doing it in a targeted way, you can actually get that to scale quite nicely. And depending on how many of these you want to do, it may be something like a few dollars to be able to do a test to, as uh, some of you know, I've tried, you know, thinking about how much could you get for $100? How much information could you get if you knew what mutation you were looking for in using technologies like this. And so there still is a space for this. Interestingly enough, again, you can tell I'm not a big Illumina fan. Illumina actually had a very large sort of business associated with this to do particular genotyping. They have actually shut down that arm of their business to force everyone to move to sequencing. So they have actually, you know, are sort of driving the market in terms of what's available um, by, uh, you know, sort of going with where they think they can make, uh, make the best profit doing this. Um, another company doing this is Affirmation. It used to be doing much better than it does today, uh, but just again from a business point of view to watch where this technology goes and uh, what ends up being successful at the end of the day. Um, I won't go through all of the details, but this is a technology that allows you to genotype for literally pennies, uh, penny or pennies per genotype as you're doing it. So the point that I wanted to make through all of these is that I, I don't expect that you know all of the technologies uh, sort of to very fine detail, but hopefully you've got kind of a feel, um, you know, for what we can do with this in terms of scale, in terms of cost, uh, giving you a sense that there are still some limitations in this and that a lot of this is still the art of interpretation. Um, we're going to get much smarter as we essentially crowdsource this and generate much larger databases, both for individuals who are, have diseases as well as, importantly, individuals who are disease-free and healthy uh, to know what normal is and importantly, know what normal is around the world. Uh, obviously, in a place like New York City, um, there are lots of different normals, um, and so we have to be able to know what all of those are to correctly interpret a personal genome.